We are very, very happy today that this keynote speech is going to help us learn a lot about OCP. OCP is a Morocco-based multinational and, and it operates, as you'll hear, in the fertilizer business. But I want to give you two statistics to help you understand how important OCP is, not only in the Moroccan context, but also in the world context. So in the Moroccan context, OCP essentially represents 20% of exports of the country, which obviously is considerable. At the world level, OCP controls about 70% of the world's phosphate reserves. So as, as Dr. Terab is going to explain to us, agriculture requires fertilizers and, and phosphate is at the core of, of, of the fabrication of, of fertilizer. So OCP controls 70% of an essential resource for the world. The company has been transforming over the last few years and, and it's been transforming in a way that is good for OCP in the sense that it's become a more innovative and a more agile company and we'll hear about this. It is also transforming in a way that is good for the world. What you'll hear this morning is a genuine sense of doing well by doing good. There is a real consciousness at the top of OCP that increasingly organizations will only be able to do well financially by doing good for the world. And then again, you'll sense this throughout the discussion this morning. We at IMD have been very fortunate to be part of this journey with OCP over the last two years. And we're also very fortunate that this morning we have with us the executive chairman and CEO of OCP, Dr. Terab. Uh, I will not go through the long bio of Dr. Terab. It is a very distinguished biography. Uh, and by the way, Dr. Terab started his career as an academic. And then a number of years ago uh, was drafted by the government into increasingly senior jobs. He is not only leading OCP today, he is also, as of 2019, the president of the International Fertilizer Organization. So we're delighted, Dr. Terab, to have you with us. Hopefully the technology will work. You will be able to turn on your camera, turn on your microphone and share with, you, uh, share with us your screen. You will share with us a few ideas for a few minutes and then we'll, we'll get to a Q&A. A warm welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manzuni. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, and the participants, and I'm looking forward to the interaction. So uh, I will uh, keep my remarks to about uh, uh, 20, 25 minutes to give a chance to, to, to maximize interaction. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to share the screen, and it should be up in a... Uh, it is now up, I think. It is now up. Okay, very good. Thank you. So, uh, I will tell you OCP's, uh, the story of its transformation almost as a story, as, as we lived it, uh, uh, as I lived it with my colleagues over the past uh, uh, 15 years, almost. Um, Dr. Manzoni mentioned the, the role of fertilizers. I will uh, just... Uh, uh, remind people, I didn't know it when I came to OCP myself uh, a while back, but uh, for the use of without fertilizer, we would only produce half of what we produce in terms of uh, agricultural production in the world. So the, the, it plays a key role in food security and fertilizers are mainly uh, a, a mixture of three nutrients uh, that we call NPK, which is simply nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. Phos uh, nitrogen can be synthesized, it can be manufactured, uh, but, but phosphorus is a fossil uh, resource. It, it takes 60 to 80 million years to produce. So. Uh, and it's therefore not renewable. And as Dr. Manzoni mentioned, Morocco holds, um, according to some estimates, here I'm showing you uh, US Geological Survey figures, uh, about 50, about 70% of uh, world reserves. So when, uh, when, the, when I joined the OCP in, um, 
uh, about in 2006, uh, it was not r really a thriving corporation. It was a loss-making operation, and it was really focused on mining and producing an intermediate product called phosphoric acid. But we immediately looked at the prospect, how can we, uh, how can we improve the bottom line? How can we uh, grow? Uh, again, keeping in mind that we, we actually at that stage were not a corporation. We were a parastatal with the with an accounting balance sheet, but had negative equity. <laughs> so, uh, and that was the, the the losses accumulated. And it was not surprising when we looked at where the the market was growing. So we were, and and this graph clearly shows it. We were mainly uh, we had a dominant world market share in phosphate rock, the the, the raw material. Uh, and phosphoric acid, which is just an intermediate product, but that market was uh, disappearing. And we were the only market that was growing was the finished product market, the fertilizer uh, market. So what we decided to do is, um, is actually go migrate down the, the value chain and try to um, uh, invest in fertilizer production. Easily said that required a huge capex program that we had to finance. Uh, that we couldn't finance it based on uh, on local financing in Morocco. So we basically corporatized our operations in 2008. So we we became a, a corporation, still state owned. We had a, a private investor, a, a local bank, uh, which was state owned uh, previously. Uh, but we became a corporation and went, and went on the international, basically, bond market to raise financing to embark on basically what was a second S-curve. The first S-curve was mainly that you can see here, we call it the rock and acid fa uh, cost curve, uh, was basically, um, you know, mining, you know, OCP, you could describe it as a mining operation. Uh, the second S curve was really had for, uh, you know, the, the goal of the second S curve was to take us uh, to some kind of position on the fertilizer market, which again required massive investment in, fertile, in, in building plants to produce fertilizer out of the phosphate rock and, and export maybe less of it. Uh, this is the, in a nutshell, the result um, of that operation. If if you see, the, you know, these are the revenues, historic revenues. You know, we were historically at less than two billion dollar revenues, and again, these are revenues. The net profits over many years before two thousand six were were negative. Uh, but you know, when we went downstream and started increasing our uh, our fertilizer production, you see the impact on revenues. You, you also will notice something interesting is uh, the variability. So basically we left a very stable world, which was not serving us, but we went into a very volatile world, which, uh, which served us. I mean, we, we, we are now profit making, uh, and contributing uh, significantly to our shareholder in terms of uh, earnings. Uh, but we have to live in a, a much more volatile world. I, I'll go back to this. And, and this, this, by the way, was, we knew it. We, we knew that the fertilizer market the, 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 was a, in price, in terms of price was volatile. So we, we ex whereas the rock market, which is a more of a B2B, these are yearly contracts, was more stable. The end result uh, was that we indeed increased our global market share in fertilizers. We became uh, the first uh, phosphate fertilizer producer in terms of volume. Uh, with about today, it's, this, these are 2018 figures, today it's about 25% uh, of global market share in phosphatic fertilizers. Uh, so we found ourselves in a, in, a, in a kind of a unique position where in many markets we were uh, competing with our own clients because we were still 
uh, exporting rock and acid to uh, historic lines. But all of a sudden we were entering um, the same markets where they operate with the finished product. Was not, was again a source of, uh, I would say, uh, complications or, or, or complexities that the, my colleagues at OCP and myself were not uh, really prepared for. Uh, you, you'll see that our largest market share, and I'll go back to that key market, is, is also in Africa, uh, which is the fastest growing market in the world. Um, so le let me uh, actually deal with Africa for a while. Um, you know, we, 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 when we looked at uh, fertilizer consumption uh, and we looked at Africa, um, we said this is really not a market. Some would think this is really not a market to look at. So we, because very low fertilizer consumption, uh, very tough logistics, uh, etc. cetera, um, the conventional wisdom was, would be, well, <laughs> let's go to where it's easier. But we, we took a second look, and this is what we looked at. We looked at the key facts, uh, and maybe really what uh, <laughs> ended up being a, an alternative narrative, which is, you know, when you talk about food security and you talk about Africa, it's usually a negative connotation. This is where food security problems, uh, you know, Africa is the locus of uh, food security issues. But if you look at global trends in terms of population growth globally, not just in Africa, and Arab land per capita globally, uh, which is decreasing because of the limitation in Arab land. We are now using globally more than 80% uh, of, of existing Arab land. You, you re, you, one realizes that Africa holds uh, the, the largest reserve of unused Arab land. You know, 60% of the unused Arab land is in, in Africa. And we say, you know, this is like the, the story of the shoemaker, the two shoemakers who visit an African village. And one of them tells the other, you know, many people are bare feet, there's no business. And the other says, this is precisely where I think we can make a difference. Uh, mindset. So we said, look, we, we have to take the African market seriously. After all, we are also in, in Africa. Um, and this is what we did. We looked at also the impact of the low use of fertilizer in Africa. I hope that I, when I'm sharing my, my, when I'm passing slides, it, uh, that uh, there's no delay, but uh, right now you should be looking, thank you, <laughs> Jean-Francois. You should be looking at the slide that correlates fertilizer use to, uh, to agricultural productivity. We took millet here, you could have taken any other crop, uh, you would have the same trends. Um, and basically you see the low use in Africa and how it impacts productivity. You know, this is, um, this is a, a very <laughs> uh, tough realization. Now, we also looked at the fact that those countries and regions that have used fertilizers have sometimes overused them, you know. Uh, China could be a case in point, and what I'm telling you is known is well known by policymakers who are trying. You know, China is again a case in point where where policymakers are trying to decrease the use of fertilizer, uh, not because they, they, they because of their costs, simply because if you overuse fertilizer, uh, you you can uh, you know the plant and the soil do not uh, absorb them fully if you if you put too much. Uh, of one or the other nutrient, and it runs off in the, in the water table with the environmental uh, degradation. So using only the right amount of fertilizer is the responsible way uh, for, 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 for all countries, and, and many countries are trying to rebalance their, their fertilization. <clears throat> but we decided that in Africa, even though we're going from a, ve a very low level of use, but uh, that really presents no environmental danger. The danger would be 
<clears throat> to to get you know to 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 take bad habits basically. So we decided that in Africa we were going to customize fertilizers from the beginning, not sell the standard fertilizer that that usually is not adapted to the soil and the plant, but you know, invest in a lot of R&D. So it starts with soil fertility maps. These are a mixture of sources, satellite imagery, but also sometimes just drawn. And sometimes it's just soil sampling, you know, in situ so soil sampling to look at what we call soil fertility maps that really tells you how much of N, P, and K is in existing soils. <clears throat> And then we go about manufacturing the right kind of fertilizer, the right mix if you, of nutrients that is appropriate for that soil and the plant and ensures that when it's applied is fully absorbed by the, this, this specific soil and the specific plant. Uh, so this is what we did. A lot of R&D, a lot of innovation, uh, and here are some of the results. Uh, the, one of the first soil fertility map we did was in Nigeria. I'm sorry, it was in Ethiopia. Uh, you see very clearly here, the, the, not just that because you don't oversell nutrients, the price of our fertilizer is almost 40% less than the standard one, but you see that the, the, the fertilizer uh, has also better results, higher yields, almost 50% higher yields. Okay, so uh, cheaper, higher yield. Guess what? Where the uh, where the Ethiopian market went, it basically did away with the standard fertilizer DAP, and in a few years started using only the the the, the specialized or, or the customized. Now this is not just a single formula. Uh, NPS has many variants, and we sometimes add zinc for uh, for uh, child nutrition and other things. So it, it, it is really customization. We did the same thing in Ghana. You can see the, the difference between the, the, the standard fertilizer and the ones we customized. Again, through the same formula, satellite imagery, etc. If we just want to look at the impact of fertilizer, customized fertilizer, here, Tanzania is even very spectacular difference. So this also has led us to territory that we did not really know. This was not just a B2C uh, uh, you know, marketing because we were selling directly to the customer, uh, we we're handling the finished product. We were customizing and, uh, and, and really in, in terms of production that translated into mass customization. But once we were in touch with the farmer, the African farmer, we realized that their needs obviously went beyond <laughs> fertilizer. They needed access to finance, insur crop insurance. They needed access to technical assistance <clears throat> and, and, and first and foremost to markets to, 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 for their crops. So little by little, we started developing an ecosystem really to go along with our product, to become a multi-service uh, provider for the African farmer. And, the, uh, and um, so basically this ecosystem that usually people build uh, as a, almost a corporate social responsibility thing, we build it because it was good business also. And because we realized that enriching our client, the, the, the small landholder farmer in Africa was good, not just for, for the farmer, but also for our business. And then we started applying the same philosophy to all our, you know, what, what we, what's called usually corporate social responsibility. So I put it here on a slide, but we've banned the term CSR in OCP because simply CSR almost conceptually is this model where, you know, you're operating and you have this, uh, uh, this circuit this, uh, of revenues and production, and CSR is, is viewed as a leak out of this normal circuit, almost, you know, the, the, the economist will tell you, <coughs> we're creating externalities, whether they are social, 
uh, or environmental <coughs> and as good citizens, corporate citizens, we try to defray some of the impact uh, by leaking some of the revenues uh, out. But we realize that this is not, first, this does not represent our philosophy, and this is not sustainable. A, a leak is not sustainable. So the, the model we went with is the other one, is to say, let's integrate you know, environmental and community service and, and all these things and training, for example, within the, the, the production cycle. Okay, so that we, 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 we don't, there's no contradiction between those activities that are usually put in the CSR label uh, and our own competitiveness. And this le has led to many things. The first one is we started training through a program we called OCP Skills, people even beyond OCP employees. We started training the youth in our mining towns, uh, in the mining times where we operated. And these youth were trained in technical skills that made them more employable by our own service providers, uh, local service providers. And lo and behold, they became more productive, more competitive, and that helped us become more competitive. So that was an investment, so to speak. It was not just a, uh, a social responsibility. We viewed it as key to our competitiveness. And in fact, all these activities, you know, you may think uh, that, I'm sorry, I'm uh, skipping. You may think that they were done out of enlightenment from the top level uh, managers in the company. There, there was really the, 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 the toughest part for us to convince was the top layers uh, and the mid-level mid managers. What we've realized is that when we launched these activities, you know, it was really the, the, the our, you know, the, the blue collar workers uh, and, uh, and the lower mid-level managers, so to speak, that really understood this. And this is a book by Vincent Lenart, where he, he, he quotes a discussion I've had with him where, where you know, we, we were, and he was a coach also at OCP at that time, where we, he really told me, look, these guys are... <laughs> Uh, uh, realizing this before before you are actually, and I said yes, they they're ahead of us, and that has really led to what we call the movement. We said, look, we 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 would gain, you know, people basically are way ahead of top management, okay, in the company. So why don't we uh, kind of liberate their energies? Why don't we, uh, you know, give them? Uh, to, in fact, total margins of maneuver. What we created is this movement, uh, which was basically telling people, allowing anyone at OCP to work first to change jobs if they wanted, to work on the kind of services and products they wanted or they felt to, 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 were better for them to work on, and, and especially in any which way they deemed uh, viable. So, for example, and, and we thought initially that this would touch headquarters, you know, this, this image of, uh, and it, it did actually start at headquarters, this image of people asking for, you know, they didn't want to stay in their offices, they didn't want to, some of them wanted to change bosses, some of them didn't want any bosses. And it worked. And they, they asked us to buy uh, yellow and orange sofas. And they, it, this is a picture of a working group. And when the manager, one of the managers, not their manager, came in the room, they, 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 they told him to actually leave the room that he wasn't entitled to be with them. Just to give you the spirit, of course, digital became uh, a key thing, not as a technology, but as the T-shirt you may not be able to read, they forced me to wear it, called being digital, and that's key. But the surprise is that it, it went way beyond the headquarters phenomenon. Even the, 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 the blue colors were actually ahead of other people, and they started saying, look, if you trust us to do the right thing, uh, don't over-manage us. 
And amazing things happen. I can tell you long stories in terms of maintenance. They actually created a, a separate corporation called OCP Maintenance to service us. So a lot of, some of the blue cars left the company uh, and cre they created the first, they built the first pump, water pump, entirely built in Morocco. Anyway, success stories, but it actually made us more competitive. For example, the pump, I'm sorry, the pump, we buy hundreds of pumps every year, if not thousands. Their pump that they manufacture is actually a third of the cost of the pump we import from outside Morocco. So they have a business and everybody, everybody's happy. And the third thing we realized was we needed massive research and development on, uh, you know, basically to embark on this third curve, which is diversify our products, invest in adjacencies, whether they're engineering, construction, uh, utilities, water and energy became very important for us. Uh, and I'll show you what we're doing there. But innovation, uh, you know, from, from agriculture, biotech, to all kinds of innovation, and indeed managerial innovation. I'll get back to this. So as this slide shows, we increased massively the amount of money we were putting in R&D, all right? Uh, a lot of the R&D goes into uh, becoming fully self-sufficient in water and energy. So the 2028, uh, the 2028 goals are going to be achieved. We're well on the way. <laughs> uh, but for example, 2028 in terms of energy is going to be 80% solar energy. Okay. And using that solar energy to desalinate water that, that, that desalinate the water that we we need uh, uh, using that energy. So again, this can be viewed as environmental responsibility. For us, it is competitiveness. You know, that solar energy, because of the R&D we've put in it, will cost us one third to one quarter of the energy we buy on the grid. And guess, and I'll finish with this, what happened is we immediately felt the need not just to create these labs that I'll describe a couple, living labs, full-scale labs in mining, in manufacturing, in solar, uh, and, and many other things. But we indeed created, so here's the mining, here's the energy, the green energy park. This is a massive investment to produce our own solar technology. We're invested in, in also taking to solar energy all the mining uh, equipment, for example, the drag line, farming, R&D. So what we ended up doing is actually build a university, uh, which we call UM6P, uh, which actually is handling a lot of our R&D, not simply in-house, but these are the partnerships of uh, UM6P. Uh, and I lined up just by mentioning that a lot of our partnerships are in, in Switzerland, in fact, in Lausanne, since we are, we have a big partnership with Le PFL. We are actually training, co-training 100 PhDs for for Africa, and moved already two years ago aggressively to digital education, which became very, <laughs> very useful a few months ago. Unfortunately, and 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 that platform of MOOCs was entirely put at the disposal of African students for free. Uh, we have a, an agreement also with L'Ecole Hôtelière de Lausanne, uh, Mass Challenge and Impulse, but the most important one is the one we have with IMD. Not, and I'm not saying this to, <coughs> to elicit a smile from uh, uh, Jean-Francois, which I did, but it's also, uh, it's also part of our uh, management innovation that I hope we'll discuss. <clears throat> that we are starting on, on the onboarding process, but we want a mainstream in all OCP, which is everyone in OCP should have the opportunity to spend two thirds, uh, one third of their time in training, one third of their time in exploration, and one third in exploitation, in, in run, in operations, just to 
so that everyone is in a, a you know a reflexive uh, approach. We've already started doing some onboarding, working very well. So I guess I'll stop here, uh, Dr. Manzoni, and I hope I didn't go too much over my allotted time. Thank you very much, Dr. Terab, for, for these, these, these thoughts. I just want to highlight one very important one uh, for, for all of, of, our, of our listeners. Um, food security and food production in Africa, of course, is important for Africa for all the reasons that we all understand. But one of the things that we at IMD learned from working with OCP is that food security in Africa could become extremely important for the rest of the world, for the reasons that Dr. Terra mentioned. So, so again, I, I just want to say this because we often think of Africa as a, a problem continent. Uh, it, clearly, it is a continent that has challenges. It is also a continent that is extraordinarily vibrant and where economic growth and the energy is just, is just amazing. And where, again, the rest of the world should not only root for them to be successful for their own sake, but also for our own collective sake. Dr. Tarab, two quick questions before, before our, our listeners uh, jump on the, uh, the Q&A. The first one, the movement. The way you described it could sound slightly scary for many of us, right? Where it sounds like you, you basically opened up an enormous amount of freedom for workers and, and, and employees at various levels. Most of us would hear this and would think, my God, if I did this in my company, it would turn into immediate chaos. The way you're describing it, it didn't turn into chaos. It turned into something very productive. Please help us understand how this is possible. Well, uh, it, it turned very productive <laughs> because people did not view it also uh, as a free for all or, uh, you know, what, what we had is this very interesting phenomenon. If we, <clears throat> you know, if we refer to McGregor's uh, X and Y, theory X, theory Y, theory X being uh, uh, command and control, bureaucratic command and control, theory Y freeing up energies, uh, well, it's not moving completely to, to why, because the phenomenon we observed and we expected was that it was also scary for those who were freed up, quote unquote, in that, in that in initially they would move and, and, and not worry about um, uh, their um, uh, you know, hierarchy or, or bu bureaucracy, etc. but very quickly they were in demand of more organization, more processes themselves. But, you know, so it's not X and Y, it's X and Y. You know, we created the, uh, you know, and it's not uh, command and control or freedom. It's command can, and it's, it's freedom within command and control. So uh, simply because, um, you know, colleagues are in need of uh, organization, are in need of some kind of guidance. So, but basically the, what unleashed the, the good part is the, the, the sense they got that we trusted them, that we, we trusted them to do the right thing. How difficult was it for you and the executive committee to overcome some of the resistance that you described at senior management level? Uh, it, it, it was something we anticipated, uh, and um, I, I would say we, 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 we dealt with it with uh, massive amounts of coaching. And amounts is the right word here, qualitative coaching. You know, you have, when you think of coaching, you have, it's all over the place. And here we were really fortunate enough to have worked previously with the coaching team, uh, Vincent Lennart's team. But what we did is actually build, uh, invite Vincent Lennart and his team to create a coaching school within UM6P. You know, so we, we internalized, so to speak, the coaching that it was not an external uh, add-on, but it was something organic to the firm. So it means that this is really interesting. It means that you realize that this, this movement would require 
ongoing coaching of, of, of leaders at various levels. And you said, look, let's, in, let's develop our own capability uh, to offer this coaching support. Yeah. One more question from me before I, I, I switch to, uh, to the panel. Um, you described investments in social and sustainable areas uh, as paying off for themselves. Basically, you said, look, we're investing in solar energy. It, it pays off. We're investing in this. It pays off. Really, there's, there's no trade-off in your, in your head, even short-term trade-offs, because people often say, I would like to do this, but, but it will cost me too much in the short run. This pays off even in the short run, or you're accepting a short-term trade-off for a long-term benefit? Uh, we, no, it's it's indeed accepting a short, uh, accepting that the benefit will be only in the long run. Okay, okay. so uh, we would never have been able to do this, uh, frankly, if we were um, uh, if 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 our shareholder was not a was not the government of Morocco, who had a long term view. On, um, on OCP, you know, keep in mind, OCP, we celebrated our 100th anniversary this year. We were born in 1920, okay? And so the first thing to do, to, the first thing was to embed this long-term culture in our shareholders, you know? They, they, they had a long-term view, but we, we really needed to, to do that, and, and the board, uh, to agree that we should have a long-term view on things, so it, it is it is accepting short-run, uh, short-term degradation not trade-offs, uh, trade-offs, but not n- not to, to move to a profit uh, to a non-profit making situation. But it, you know, some of it paid off uh, fairly quickly. For example, energy. The minute we you replace renewable, and it costs uh, half the price of the energy on the grid, then it, it really hits the bottom line uh, very visibly. So one of the points clearly is ensuring stakeholder support, stakeholder in terms of board and shareholders. Two very good questions. I mean, four very good questions, but two of them more specialized. Uh, one is, what was the biggest challenge that you faced when you went downstream and started to compete with your historic customers? Did you manage to keep them along? So, so you, you mentioned that this was a challenge. Can you comment a bit on, on how this process worked when you started competing with your own customers? Uh, well, o- over, overall, it went well because uh, we first we kept, you know, we, we could also have stopped uh, serving uh, them with the uh, rock. Uh, phosphate, that would be very aggressive competition and just say, look, we're moving downstream and we're now uh, producing fertilizer and we, we don't want to compete. So just the fact that we maintained and, and committed to maintain uh, supplying them with raw material was, uh, was a key thing. The other thing is we, we also partnered with some of these clients in, on distribution uh, Etc. Uh, very few uh, hiccups, maybe in a few markets, but since in North America, it's it, you know we're in a current uh, battle uh, with one of the, our competitors. Uh, uh, so I'm not going to comment on this. It's in the, it's in front of the uh, in International Trade Commission. So we, we will see we will see what happens. So what you're saying is, look, it wasn't perfect everywhere. And in one area, clearly, we are still involved in uh, in friction. But we discussed, we engaged with them. In some cases, we even partnered with them on this new business. And overall, with effort, it worked out. Yeah, I I would say, I would just add one one key thing there. uh, And this is very important, is we is how the is to be proactive in changing the representation that these clients and competitors had of the company you know that if they if they kept in mind that we should be just this uh, um, uh, uh, suppliers reliable supplier of raw material uh, and that's how they viewed us 
uh, you know, that we had to handle the representation of OCP and convince them that we were, we, we were transforming to a different animal. That, so as, at least that the clash of representations uh, is, is not what dictates their, um, uh, their actions. Right, help them change the image they had of the company. Yeah. One very good question. The hype is created by innovative products and processes. The hype in a positive sense, right? There's excitement about the specialized fertilizer. How do we keep the momentum going on the less glamorous parts of the business? Ah, uh, well, uh, excellent question. How do you, uh, you know, how do you have exploitation and exploration cohabit? Uh, it's the old uh, uh, curse uh, is, you know, and we experienced it. Uh, uh, you know, when, when you move a large team in exploration, uh, you know, basically building the new S-curve, uh, well, you, 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 you have two tendencies, natural tendencies that you have to fight. One is that the new people uh, or the, new, the people in exploration tend to think of themselves as first-class citizens. You know, they are the ones closer to the digital and the et cetera. So you have to manage their ego. <laughs> and this is where coaching, by the way, plays a big, 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 big role. I cannot understate it, okay? Look, this is not because you're in exploration uh, and dealing with the sexy stuff, so to speak, that your attitude should change towards basically workers and blue collars that are in exploration. Uh, especially that you can have also resentment on the other side where they say, right. well, these people are simply living off because basically they're not making revenues yet. Uh, so, uh, and, and it's natural, um, I would say, tendency. So we constantly also explain that The, for people who are today in exploration, that they are simply benefiting from yesterday's exploration, okay? But at the end, it is what I showed in the last slide, is that it, for each part to respect the other, they have to live it. This is why we're encouraging everyone at OCP, whether they're in exploration, exploitation, not to, to spend time on the other side of the of the. Uh, of the Uh, of the uh, of the the operation so as i said the uh, we're starting with the onboarding okay you know you come on board ocp you may have uh, uh, you know uh, an mba or something of the sort uh, uh, it may be even from um, imd but you're going to have to spend a lot of time on the site and you're going to have to be on the plant and spend half one third, sorry, of your time there, just to get to respect and understand what's happening there. So making sure that the whole organization, including the newcomers, understand the value that is being generated by the quote unquote less glamorous part of the business and celebrating that part of the business. Exactly. Uh, too many questions for me to ask. Uh, one of them, regarding the ecosystem that you created as a part of this third S-curve, you said third S-curve starts with specialized fertilizers, and then we realized there were other things we could be doing. Did, did something inspire you to look at this? How did this realization come about, and how did you decide where to play and, and where not to play in these new possibilities? Well, what, 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 what decided basically things is the availability of this ecosystem in Morocco to start with. Let me give an example. When we embarked 12 years ago on this big CapEx program, $8 billion, building new plants that we didn't know much about, uh, we needed engineering services. You know, in-house in Morocco, there, there are a couple of engineering firms, but None of the, by definition, none of them had any competency in uh, in building fertilizer plants, uh, etc. So we simply said we can either, you know, uh, sign a big contract with the U.S. or Australian firm, or we can invite them to come to Morocco, establish an engineering firm, 
uh, you know, uh, and and commit the the business uh, to to jumpstart that engineering firm. That's what we did with Jacobs Engineering. We created Jeza uh, with 50-50 percent um, uh, ownership. 95 percent of the engineers are Moroccan and trained in Morocco. Uh, it's a very competitive engineering firm, and it has become, after eight years, the largest engineering firm in Africa. Uh, so, so, but the initially necessity, out of necessity. necessity. Okay, necessity was the driver. Hmm. Dr. Tara, we are three minutes over, over time. We have committed to give our OWP participants uh, at least a 10 minute break between sessions. I'm very grateful that you took the time to be with us. There are a few questions that we didn't get to. Is it okay if I send them to your office and maybe one of, one of your colleagues under your um, inspired leadership can, can maybe post some replies? Would that be okay? With pleasure, Dr. Manzoni. We'll, we'll, we'll answer uh, all, all the, the questions. Thank you so can. very much. And uh, again, I hope that each of you uh, watching us this morning is, is trying to identify insights that, that can be relevant to you. You're all operating in different contexts, of course. One of the things that I get every time I interact with Dr. Terab or with his OCP colleagues is this incredible sense of energy and this incredible sense of ambition Ambition in a positive sense, ambition about creating value, of course, for the company, but also creating value for the world. And, and, and I find this incredibly energizing and inspiring. I hope you did too. Thank you again very much, Dr. Terab, and have a great second day of WP. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Take care.